This has put a lot of blood on my hands. Out God, the Fast and Furious Scandal, only on Fox Nation. It's had an entire class of people known roughly as public intellectuals, philosophers. Now, a lot of them even then were buffoons, but not all. They were some serious people. That whole class is gone. Those who took their place study and talk about mostly themselves, their identity. It's narcissism, not philosophy. One of the very few left operating in the shadows of the internet, needless to say, is a man called Curtis Yarvin. For years, he blogged under the name Mencius Moldbug. Now, we should say that Curtis Yarvin has a job. He's a software developer. But purely because he had something to say, he wrote about a million words for free on the internet about his life philosophy. Now, personally, I would be lying if I said I understood all of it, don't have the necessary IQ to claim that. But I can say, having read a lot of it, it's interesting as hell, provocative, gets you thinking, and more than anything, adds needed perspective on the moment we're in now. For the crime of saying interesting things, Curtis Yarvin has been hounded nonstop by the people who write Wikipedia, by the banks, <laughs> by the people who maintain the status quo at all costs. We think, particularly because we have a full hour, that it would be worth talking to Curtis Yarvin about what he makes of the moment we're living in right now. By the way, if you're interested in reading more, he writes on Substack. It's called Gray Mirror is his feed, I guess, on Substack. Anyway, Curtis Yarvin, a genuinely interesting person. We're honored to have him with us today. Thank you for that lovely intro, uh, Tucker. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be <laughs> Oh, no. This is one of those conversations. <laughs> Does that where... sound too fake? Was that too fake? I just said... No, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even... I, I just have wanted to have you on because I think you're really interesting. I don't understand everything that you're arguing. I don't know if I agree with it or not. But I do know that you're considered highly controversial mm -hmm. um, by people, which is almost always a sign that you are saying things that are worth thinking about. I don't think, I've read a lot of your stuff. I, I don't think you're a hater in any sense. You're not calling for anyone to be heard. I don't think you're crazy. I think you're pretty far out in a way that is worth thinking about. Anyway, thank you for coming. I, 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 I appreciate this. I think actually just to put the, uh, you know, uh, I, th I think the best slur out there is that if you read my Wikipedia biography, um, it basically has me saying that black people should be enslaved because they're congen congenitally stupid. Um, <laughs> that's a, which is a remarkable thing to say. Actually, I think that's what my bank canceled me for. And it's if you actually read the place that it's coming from, it's this sort of beautiful conjuncture of two sort of completely separate things, neither, neither of which says that. And, but if you sort of read it straight out, kind of stereotypically, you read that. And I'm just like, this is beautiful. I'm well, like, this is a beautiful work of propaganda directed at me. But it's me. such a it's, slur. I mean, oh, I know, I know, I know. Children and, uh, and yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think, I think, I think, I think recently my son actually got canceled from his soccer team. Uh, for that, I'm not sure, but there was something like that. It worked out well in the end. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a remarkable experience, sort of, and in a way, like when I look at the things that, you know, sort of out of this million words that you get sort of noticed or canceled for, you basically learn not how to not do these things and how to not create the opportunities right. for these kinds of strange constructions. But it's just so but, interesting that they want, and I, I can't overstate this since for our audience that reads, you know, to, Take an hour and read Curtis Yarvin, and it's, it, it, it bears no resemblance to the way that it's characterized, but it's interesting that they focused on you to shut you down. You're clearly saying things that threaten them. So let's just give our viewers a taste of what you actually think. So our withdrawal from Afghanistan devolved immediately into a profound humiliation for the United States and the American empire, such as it is. Take three steps back as a philosopher and assess what this tells us about our current system and well, our leaders. Well, whenever you're humiliated, um, it should be always be a learning experience. Yes. You're, you're being, as a person, 
you're being humiliated because you learned something that was painful to you yes. that you didn't want to know or didn't want to be reminded of. Yes. Um, and, and, and that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, having been, been, been humiliated. And it's a beautiful and necessary and wonderful thing. And there are two kinds of people who respond to humiliation in two different ways. Either basically they take that in and they're like, okay, what was it that I learned that was so painful and how do I avoid making the same mistake again and getting humiliated again in the same way? Or, you know, they're sort of more the narcissistic type and they go into this kind of narcissistic rage where they're just like, I never want to hear it. They blame the messenger, essentially. <laughs> and, 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 and they blame the messenger. And, and so, you know, with sort of the fall of Afghanistan, I think that there are a lot of people who still think of the U.S. government as having the competence that it had 50 years ago, 70 years ago, even in the fall of Saigon, which was basically a masterpiece compared to this. Yeah. And, 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 and so they look at this, you know, these are Americans out there and they have a kind of, you know, deeply ritual association with the real Washington. And both of us have a family background in the real Washington. Yes. And so, you know, what they think of... And pause there and, and just tell our, our viewers what your background is. Oh, um, um, you know, my dad was a foreign service officer, which is... Uh, so I went around living in embassies and consulates around the world. I was kind of a... Uh, an international Jew, you might say. Actually, I always wanted like a lifetime subscription to International Jew Magazine. Can't you see it? Um, you know, but I was, I'm, I'm a rootless cosmopolitan. So, um, so you know, so I, I grew up really in the belly of this beast, right? And the thing is, it's like, for example, I was recently out, I, I drove across the country in both directions with my kids, an incredible experience and um, beautiful, amazing country. We were driving through Iowa, you know, on July 4th and all around, all the little towns start sending up their fireworks, you know, boom, boom, whatever. We went to the July 4th rodeo in Livingston, Montana. Yeah. You know, there were, and they even dared to like, you know, the announcer even like talk trash about the liberal media. You know, you know so they, they basically, they, they know that something's up, you know, yeah. in a way. And yet, you know, you have sort of all of the paraphernalia of patriotism that you sort of feel so deeply out there. And this patriotism is this kind of ritual sort of religious allegiance. It's like if you're a Catholic, it isn't necessarily because you love the personal habits of the Pope. Right. Right. And you know, you're, you're down on like Vatican politics or whatever. So, you know, the sort of the difference that, that kind of I think needs to be exploded for a lot of people is what is the difference between sort of my ritual respect for this thing and what it actually is? Because when I actually look at, you know, what the Vatican is, or in this case, the swamp, the deep state, as the cathedral, as I've sometimes called it, you know, the sort of the, the oligarchic power structure of America, which is completely decentralized, there is no center to it anywhere, there is no, like, they, there is no one you can point to, there's no race or class or little meeting of, like, protocols of the elders of Zion that's happening, right. there's no conspiracy, it's completely decentralized. That's what makes it so hard to kill. And, and, yes. um, and so when you look at the way this ruling class works and governs, it's a very different thing from these sort of abstractions that you learn in 11th grade civics class. And, you know, and when you grow up in that, in it, you feel it, you know, extremely intensely. And so, for example, people will go and they'll vote for president and they'll, you know, they sort of vote as if who was sitting in the White House, you know, was who was in power. And they'll use these terms like, you know, Trump is in power, Biden is in power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, guys, Americans, when you're inside the belly of this beast and you look at the White House as an organization, and the White House is not even really properly controlled by the president, uh, you know, the White House's whole budget and organization is set by Congress. It's full of permanent employees. It's not even... But if you look at the White House as a whole and measure its kind of relevance to the normal process of the executive branch, of the actual government that people like our parents lived and worked in, you're like, it has almost no relevance at all. In the, in the deep state, uh, you know, as Americans, it's a Turkish word that Americans have learned to use, it's a great word. Um, you know, in the deep state, the way you regard this election, this stupid, really, ceremony that happens over there that's like for, there's a clown show for the clowns, it's like a storm on the surface above a coral reef. You're a fish in the reef, you know, you're going about your fishy business. 
um, you know, you're eating algae or whatever, there's a big storm, you know, you, you're kind of sucked back and forth a little bit, you feel it, you know, it makes it a little harder to nibble algae, but like waves are not breaking on you. Yeah. And so waves are not breaking on you down there. And so when people look at this thing, you know, they sort of make this kind of couple of mistakes. They're like, okay, we elected Trump, so Trump's in power. I'm like, well, if you took that phrase literally and you said Trump is in power, for example, Trump is the chief executive of the executive branch. One way philosophically to think about this question is how much power does Donald Trump personally have over this executive branch? That's a hard thing to measure, but one way to measure this is to know that it has two endpoints. So he could have no power or he could have complete power. He could have zero or one. So where is he in his power over the executive branch, which constitutionally is under his complete control? Where is he in terms of his power over this organization? Is he closer to zero or closer to one? So one way to ask that question is to say, well, could we increase his power by 10 times? Could we make the White House 10 times as powerful over the executive branch? Very easily. Could we imagine, you know, at that point, we're reaching the powers of, say, LBJ? Could we make the White House 100 times as powerful over the executive branch? At this point, we're up to the powers of FDR. So, you know, people think when they vote for Donald Trump that they're voting for the same job that FDR had. They're actually voting for, like, 0.01% of that job, which is a, right, like, a really serious, like, that is a really serious misinterpretation of reality. And foisting that level of a misinterpretation of reality on people is actually, it's a really serious offense. It's really not good. And so getting- Why, why is it not good? It's not good because you're gaslighting people. They're living in, they're basically looking at this simulated world. One way to, one way to think about this question, I will get back to Afghanistan. Yeah. One way to think about this question is to, and this is a very fundamental question of political science. Um, this is, um, I'm a member or uh, a, a votary of what, what some call the Italian school of political science or the Machiavellian school. Um, I want to just pimp the best intro to this school that is available, which is The Machiavellians by James Burnham, um, written in 1940. It's actually his best book. Most people say The Managerial Revolution, which is really not as good in my opinion. It's good, but this is amazing. And Burnham is basically like, look, you have to assume that you're living in The Truman Show. You have to assume that the entire nature of political reality may not be as you conceive it at all. And so, you know, you're electing Trump or you're electing Biden and you're thinking, you know, you're sort of changing the course of the nation. You're actually kind of moving these fish in the coral reef, you know, back and forth a few inches with, you know, the big waves you think you're generating. Um, and you're making a misinterpretation of reality, which is like someone who thought that Queen Elizabeth II was actually in charge of the UK. And so everybody knows when they look at the Queen of England that the Queen of England does not actually run the government and cannot right. say off with his head and all the things that a, a queen queen could do. They know she's not a queen. They know she's basically just a um, very classy Kardashian. Yeah. Sorry, Ro, I'm like, uh, you know, um, as, a, as, as a monarchist, I'm never gonna live this one down. But, um, um, you, know, you know, they know that she's just a very classy Kardashian. And the thing is that legally, you, you know what Queen Elizabeth II can do? She can veto an act of parliament. She actually has the right to veto just like the president does. Do you know when that, that power was last used? It was last used, I believe, in something like 1707 by Queen Anne. And what the British did was, I mean, this is a very old thing. What the British did was they basically had all of this conflict in the 17th century between, you know, the sort of the old, the Stuart monarchy and the rising middle classes. And the eventual solution was that they replaced the real monarchy with a fake monarchy. Right. Which, you know, had no actual sort of real power. And this was kind of, this transition was like through William of Orange and Queen Anne. And a lot of people hoped that Queen Anne, who was actually a Stuart, would restore the Stuarts. And of course she didn't. Um, and so at that time, this myth that here you have the king or the queen and they're actually in charge, but they're actually fake. This is an active weapon of deception. Right up to World War II, people are like charging, who, who would die for the queen now? Like for this like, you know, 
a classy Kardashian, right? In World War I, guys are going you know, over the top across the trenches for you know, the king. And, and they actually, you know, this legend is sort of more and more believed. And at the equivalent of like the rodeo, whatever they do in England in like 1910, people are like, you know, they stand up for this royal whatever. This is a country that, has ceased to been, that ceased to be a monarchy in any kind of real functioning way in 1688. So people can really very much misunderstand the system of government that, that they live in. And, and feel, you know, if you're like, one way, very simple way to sort of think about, you know, the question of democracy is you can ask two questions. Do we live in a democracy and should we? You will find very, very few people who answer no to both of those questions. And so if you look at the question of basically do but you will find many who will answer no to the first question. Yes, you will find many who will answer no to the first question, but their ways of giving that answer are sort of biased by their feeling that living in a, in a democracy is the way this should work. And so when they look at, you know, why they often, so people, let's say, you know, how do you hack an election? So, you know, people will be like, oh, you go into the voting machines or you print up, you know, spare ballots in, in China or whatever. No, you know, these are rookie, these are rookie numbers. Like, this is not how you hack, hack an election. The way you hack an election is by changing the meaning of the election. And the way you hack an election is not by changing, eliminating your ability to vote for a certain candidate, but by simply taking away the power from the politicians you elect. In other words, turning them from Elizabeth I, who actually could say off of your head, to Elizabeth II. And so when you look at the legal positions that Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II occupied, they're exactly the same position. She's the queen. Like, you know, she's, she has, you know, uh, technically in the English constitutional system, it's called reserve powers. She could declare martial law tomorrow. Like, you know, and, and actually I think it would work. <laughs> and, uh, that's a separate conversation. Uh, um, um, you know, and, and she has all of these powers on paper. And in practice, she's a classy Kardashian. And so the question, you know, of how do you hack an election is very, very simple. Instead of turning the queen into a classy Kardashian, turn the electorate into a classy, classy Kardashian. So if you basically say you're electing these politicians and you're behaving in this election as though these politicians you elected were actually in control of the government, when they're actually about 0.001% in control of the government, and the government is just this permanent deep state thing that just sits there and kind of rots and gets worse every decade, um, then, and you can't change this with elections at all. Sorry, haha. It's actually pretty funny that you tried when it's not scary. It's like scary funny, like one of those Halloween movies. Yeah. This is the attitude of the lib, right? You know, and, and look at these, you know, it sort of goes from like, look at these yokels with pitchforks to like, ah, they're gonna pitchfork us to like, look at these funny yokels with pitchforks, right? You grew up with this mentality. so. It, so did I. Uh, you know, the, the, that's how you felt toward the people that you ruled over. You're like, these people are funny and dangerous. This is the attitude of Brooklyn toward, you know, the Midwestern conservative. You're giving me your famous Tucker look. Is that because you're confused? Or? No, I'm not confused at all. Like, <laughs> Do you not recognize this attitude? I recognize it, but all of a sudden the synapses are firing. And I'm thinking deeply about what right, you're saying. Right, right. So, so, so the and, thing and is, by the way, can I say one thing? These conversations, I mean, whatever, you know, people watching this think of what you're saying. When was the last time you heard anybody say anything like that? I mean, I think the thing I object to most about modern America is how boring and repetitive it is. No one with interesting thoughts is ever in public saying anything. Everyone is just like reading the same stupid, stultifying slogans. And it's just like the fact that you're crushed for saying something that's interesting, it just tells you everything See, about I, how you know, leaden these people are. Let me, let me actually correct you there. Let's go back to the subject of um, cancellation that I started this episode with in, uh, in such a fun way, um, um, which is actually, I don't think that's true. I actually don't think, um, one of the things, one of the ways as a somewhat canceled person, uh, you know, not that I'm uh, not doing fine, um, is even though even though I'm certainly no longer a software developer, um, the one of the things about sort of this conflict that I think is a mistake 
Um, you know, I don't know how many libs uh, will be watching your show, but you know, certainly a lot of cons will be out there. And there's a lot of kind of typical mistakes that people make that I want to caution people against. And one of the biggest ones is that when you look at the libs, you see an enemy. That's true in a certain sense. That's true kind of spiritually. Spiritually, they see you as an enemy. They have the friend-enemy distinction. And that, you know, you may not know it's a civil war, conservatives, but they know it. Uh, it's a cold civil war, uh, you know, but... Um, that's you know, how they feel. That's how they feel. That's absolutely how they feel. And that is not a new thing. That is how I grew up feeling. And, and, and I was born in the freaking Nixon administration. Uh, will you bleep me on the show if I swear, or is it no, the internet? No, oh my no, God. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so the um, that's how that's how yes. I mean, you know, my my grandparents were American communists. That's how they felt. That was the sort of the standard feeling about the yokels with the pitchforks, when they they were either funny or dangerous. Yeah. And 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 you look down. You're flying from like you know New York to L.A. Uh, you've got a thing to go to, you look down, you see all that flat, and you think funny, and then you think dangerous, and those are the two neurons you have. Yeah. Uh, and that is your, basically, tolerance, right? You know, <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's, what you, that's what you learned at Brown. That's how you learn to think, right? You know, um, and, um, um, I, which is just a, a remarkable way to see the world, right? And so, especially so if you're spiritually, in charge of it, yeah. especially you're, if you're in charge of it, as they are. And, and as, as we, these are, these are, this is me, this is my people. Uh, of course we're in charge of it. And, and this way of seeing the world, you know, results in, you know, um, uh, you know, I was just, uh, you know, um, talking to the, uh, your, your, your makeup professional. And she was like, when, you know, she's not even like a, from like a lib world. Like she's from she's from a leftist kind of, but a small town American world. And like she goes to work for someone associated with Fox, and she gets all of this flack. It's like basically she's like betrayed her world. Okay, so there is that enemy, you know, psychology there, right? But in terms of how they act, they're predators and not enemies. And so if you don't give them anything, they don't have anything and they'll basically move on. It's, it's an asymmetric now, you know, as of course you increase in prominence, you know, it's, it's harder to avoid this effect. But I think for most ordinary people out there, um, it's really important to remember this. It's an asymmetric conflict, like it's not like a lion against a tiger, it's like a lion against a buffalo. As a buffalo, your goal is not to be eaten by lions. Right. You should not make any mistake that allows you to be eaten by lions. Your interest in hurting lions, Killing lions, harming lions, doing any damage to this or any other lion, if it's a way to stop them from hurting you, which in this case it's not, uh, go ahead. Otherwise, you don't care. And that's basically the attitude of a prey species. What I'm saying is that basically cancellation attacks tend to be opportunistic. If you were a dissident in, say, Hungary in 1963, there would be an intelligence agency that was basically looking after you and basically finding ways to attack you. We don't quite have anything like that yet. It's kind of, you know, they're working on it. I will say they're working on it. I've I will say it's more like that than it used to be. I think you've had some experiences. I have, yeah. Um, um, but it's still, it's not that impressive compared to Hungary in 1970. And it's certainly not something that's going to affect most people's lives in a centralized way. And so what you're really looking at as someone who is a dissident in any way is the thing to avoid is sort of playing into their game where you're this scary person. And so whenever you try to scare them, whenever you express hostility toward them, whenever you basically, you know, sort of express any kind of sort of aggression, you're basically behaving in a way that that buffalo would not behave. And you're certainly behaving also in a way that Mao Zedong would not advise you to behave. And so, you know, that, that distinction for me, you know, is really, really important. No, I don't think I get canceled for saying interesting things. I think I get basically, you know, get canceled for saying things that people who hate me can easily misconstrue. And, and that's a, but you But know, they hate you because why? They hate you because you are... They hate me because I sympathize with their enemies. And so, you know, the, 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 um, you know, they hate me for the exact same reason they hate your makeup professional. And when you sympathize, when you have this friend-enemy distinction, 
when you have this sort of, you know, kind of idea of we're at war with these people, I mean, I can't tell you how uh, when w Walter Mondale lost the election in 1984, I was living in Cyprus, um, you know, off the, off the coast of Turkey, little, little island there. Yep. And I was getting my news two or three days late because we can only read the International Herald Tribune. And I was 11 years old. I was just utterly devastated that this like foul creature Reagan had won an election over this like fundamentally good and decent and wise man, Walter Mondale. You might have had the same, well, you know. I did uh, not have the same you reaction. You did not have the no. same reaction, right. You know, um, 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 but that was absolutely my reaction. And, and, and you have this reaction when you're part of, and this is true, by the way, of any aristocracy and any sort of ruling class, especially in an oligarchy where there's sort of no kind of center of power to balance aristocratic power. In an oligarchy like ours, in a world that's ruled by the deep state or the swamp or the cathedral or whatever you want to call it, this world of permanent influential people inside and outside the government. Um, and it's, it's very important that many of them, many of these power centers are outside the government proper. I've noticed. And, and you might have noticed that. Um, and, and they're beyond the control of the population. Yeah, yeah. That makes them completely unaccountable. Uh, you know, to sort of digress a little bit, if you took the New York Times and or all, you know, all the prestigious mainstream media, just shut down the rest, it's all dying anyway. You know, like the two or three most prestigious outlets. And instead of calling them private companies, you called them the Department of Information, nothing about their lives would change. They would still be the purveyor, the official purveyors of official information. Yeah. What you have is actually these sort of government agencies that due to our wonderful constitution have grown up, you know, sovereign beyond the reach of any accountability whatsoever. In fact, you know, you can make a pretty strong case that the most powerful organ of government in the government today is not even in the government. I would say it is probably the New York Times. That's at least a reasonable thought. And you know, the interesting question is, OK, is the New York Times a democracy? Is it, um, how is the New York Times governed? And then you think about it, and you're like, Oh, I see. It's a fifth generation hereditary absolute monarchy. Um, and, and try as you may, you cannot eliminate this form of government. And, and, and that's what gives it its weight and its prestige. The very font that the New York Times is written in is saying, respect this fifth generation. It's fifth? Is it fifth? At least. At least generation absolute monarchy. And in fact, I think one of the reasons that we've had this sort of, you know, um, woke explosion since, um, you know, I, I try to not use that word because if you've noticed, they've stopped using it. Yeah. Um, um, but, uh, you know, it's so easy to say. Uh, one of the reasons we've had this latest woke explosion since 2013, actually, I think one of the problems the Times has now, for any like Times people who are listening, I know it's not likely, but any Times people out there, um, I think your problem is that you have a weak king. I think the latest Salzberger is letting his office be run by the office slack. Yeah. And I think that basically that is doing what an oligarchy does, which is to reward increasingly unbalanced perspectives. Why do you, that's a very interesting observation. Why do oligarchies reward increasingly unbalanced? I mean, that would yeah. seem like not a great self-preservation strategy. Uh, well, th yeah, there's no strategy here. It's a decentralized oligarchy, right? And so, you know, you basically have to sort of look within this mindset of the American governing class, the people who went to, you went to a good school, right, Tucker? I went to a bad school. Well, really? Yeah. I, I, I went to Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. I wish I didn't. Uh, never mind. Trust. trust, uh, trust. <laughs> well, I, you know, I was I'm, unimpressed to be there. I was unimpressive while I was there, and I'm ashamed that I wasted four years. There. Well, I'm a I'm a legacy Brown admit, and uh, um, I'm not sure I needed the legacy admissions, but the fact is I got it. And um, um, Brown you know, University in Providence, Brown, Rhode Island. Yes, yes, and Brown University in Providence, Providence, Rhode Island. And, you know, all I can say about these people who believe the woke explosion started in 2013 or whatever is, uh, you know, they should have been at Brown with me in 1991 because right. it's exactly the same doctrine. Yeah. And, and, you know, so that just means that its roots cannot be later. It's like if you found like a bat coronavirus from 1991, right? You know, you can't say, well, this was created in 2013. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and so, so it's, it's, a very, it's a very deep problem. And, uh, you know, it doesn't date to 1991 either. This is a very, this is sort of a deep strain of thinking in the American aristocracy, in the American upper class. 
It's the way these people who sort of were my people think. And, uh, you know... The, where does it come from? Oh, uh, my gosh, where does it come from? I think that, you know, there's a couple of ways that you can answer that question. Uh, it, uh, one fun way is to answer it genealogically. And so you can kind of work backward in time and say, where, who are the people... Take the way the average American college student thinks in 2021. Now let's find the people in 1921 who think like this person. Where are these people? Did they exist? Did these, were these attitudes invented? And if you go back in 1921 and you look for people who think like Americans today, you will find these people. Um, they'll be in Greenwich Village. They'll be in Provincetown. They'll be, you know, you know contain many like super rich trust fund people. Um, you know, they're the people that John Reed went to Harvard with. Right. One exactly. of the things I say is, you know, uh, the, the most accurate historical movie that I know of is Reds, Reds with John Reed, because all you have to do is take these people, put them in funny clothes, give them funny accents, and tell them to act naturally. And, and you basically, you're like, yeah, why well, the Hollywood stars of the 1980s, they have the same sexual habits as the, you know, ruling class of the 1920s. They hang out in the same places. They're the same people. Right, you know, this is, this is something, once you establish that this sort of way of thinking and this way of being modern is older than anyone alive, it's actually a really helpful observation because it makes you sort of stop blaming people and start to think more about structures. The system. The system, and it's like, what rewards you know, these kinds of ideas? It's very, very simple. It's like, if you read anyone's college application essay, what is the most common thing that these people who are applying to college because they're applying literally you're on your college application, you are ranked as, the Amer as a member of the American aristocracy as surely as Peter the Great's table of ranks. Okay, you are applying, when you apply to college, you are applying for a rank. The fact that it's not official, there isn't like some like badge you get or anything like that. Okay, sure, but you're applying for a rank. And what do you say when you're applying for, for a rank? Very simple, you wanna change the world. You wanna make an impact. Everyone basically who aspires to matter in this country, in this world today, is someone who wants to make an impact. What you're saying when you say, I wanna make an impact, is literally you are saying, I want power. And because you are literally saying, I want power, and feeling powerful, even though there's no possible world in which millions of people can actually literally hold power, which means affect government decisions or affect government authority, they're saying, I want to be powerful. And so if you want to be powerful, and there's basically all of this um, essentially pornography of power out there saying you can you know, feel powerful by supporting this. You can feel powerful by putting this sign in your yard. This, putting this sign in your yard reminds you that you matter, that you're trying to make a difference, that you realize how bad things are. Often you'll like think of the powers that be as completely imaginary corporate conspiracies or something like that. Um, and you'll basically be like, I'm making a difference, which your sign actually says, this sort of goes back to the kind of Machiavellian approach of seeing you know, the difference between sort of the objective and the subjective reality. What all of those signs really say, I'm cribbing from a famous, uh, dissident essay from Václav Havel here, what they really all, all say is, I support power. I support the government. I support yeah. the parties in charge. Exactly. I, am, I, think, I think this every day as <laughs> and, I look and, around. And, you know, and it's just like, it's like, it's like the glasses and, and they live, you know? When I drive and, by and I see a Black Lives Matter sign in someone's driveway, what they're saying is, I'm obedient to the regime. Yeah, yeah, or I love power. And yeah. so there's a sort of duality between loyalty and, ambi and ambition. Because what you're saying is, I am loyal to the regime, and I am happy for the feeling of powerful that be, the feeling of power that being part of the party is giving me. Exactly. Um, and and so it's just it's the most common thing in the world. And and you know you look at this regime, and what's so funny is that Americans are exposed to all of this starting in like, you know, childhood. They're exposed to all of this like dystopian fiction. Like you're constantly reading about dystopias in your like YA books and your like, you know, it's, it's nonstop. And yet, you know, you have these sort of basic dystopian things like, you know, 
the government, uh, you know, these signs actually say, I love power, which is exactly what Václav Havel said uh, in Czechoslovakia in 1976. But, so, I wonder if there's any way in which our system of government is anything like Czechoslovakia's in 1976. Well, I think it's very close to it. In some, in some ways, it's, the difference is it had a center. It had a center, and ours does not have a center. And there was a, there was a, there was a Politburo in Czechoslovakia in 1976. There was a Central Intelligence Agency. This was, um, you know, this was a classic totalitarian structure. And the thing is, what happens to Americans is they sort of look for this center and they don't find it. And they don't understand how the system can basically evolve to this point without having some kind of central control because they see they, you know, the, my, one, of the, one of the various concepts that people find in this million words that they really like is my idea of the cathedral. Yes. And the point that I keep making is, is it's simply, it's a Socratic point, it's simply a question. What is your theory of why the Washington Post and the New York Times and every other prestigious and the Guardian and every other prestigious voice in society and every prestigious university in society is always on the same page? Yes. It looks as though there was some, why does Yale, why do Yale and Harvard always agree on everything? Couldn't Yale become, go libertarian while, you know, Harvard is, is going woke? Like, why wouldn't that happen? And you just, you look at reality and you're like, that's, there's no way that could happen. That could never happen. And if it could never happen, it means that these organizations are essentially branches, uh, you know. Of the it, same it, thing. Of the same thing. But when you look at their organizational structure, you don't find any evidence of that. And you're like, where, is, where are the wires? Like, I'm looking at this and I'm not seeing the wires. When I saw, you know, when you look at, say, the history of any authoritarian regime, whether Sorry, it's- Sorry, I gotta ask my producer, are you following this? <laughs> when, 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 when you look at, you know, sort of the power structure of Eastern Europe, Nazi Germany or whatever, it's a classic dictatorship, classic dystopia. You see the Fuhrer. The Fuhrer has a minister of information. Right. And he's like, print this. There's an org chart. That. There's an org chart. There's an org chart. And when you look at Harvard and Yale and, you know, the whole rest of the system, okay, you know, there are these accreditation bodies. There are various yeah. funding things. But there's no org chart. And, and the thing is, you can sort of basically work very hard to kind of see an org chart that isn't really there. Or you can think very hard about why this happens. And I can tell you very, I mean, it's really, it's not a hard concept to explain. I think it's a hard concept to evangelize or it's actually, it's a pretty subtle concept, unfortunately. When you think about the way these oligarchies work, the model of the people who believe in these things that put the signs on you know, their lawns is actually very reasonable. They're like, why should we delegate these decisions to Harvard? And the answer is Harvard and Yale and the whole you know, other you know, collective of this world. Why do we delegate these decisions to these, you know, these people? There are very, very clear pragmatic reasons for doing that. One is we know that these institutions select the smartest people around. They're incredibly competitive. They're incredibly hard to get into. They're incredibly hard to rise in. And they create these incredible concentrations of expertise. And, um, well, maybe, maybe, you know, the way I think about COVID is a good example of the way these things go wrong. So basically, that view of the world is, says, when the public has to make decisions about virology, who are we going to call? And the oligarchic answer is, obviously, we are going to call the virologists. Oh, what, are we going to call your, like, aunt in Iowa? What, right. excuse me, the one I saw from the plane at 30,000 feet? <laughs> like, are we going to call the people at the rodeo? Uh, no, no, we'll call the virologists, right? I got it. I'm brilliant, right? So, you know, this was, this was their, you know, this was their answer. And this is a 20th century answer. This is, you know, the idea of basically just delegating without any accountability, responsibility for important decisions to academics basically kind of dates mostly to the Woodrow Wilson era. Yes. So, you know, the progressive era with a capital P, right. you know, it's about, and this is when basically America's, uh, so if you see like description of, of the Gilded Age, like, you know, go to an old American city, see all those like brick buildings and, and like, you know, beautiful old stuff, you know, all of like DC, you know, all of that is built in what we call the Gilded Age, which is a period when America was governed very much the way China is now. It was very corrupt. Politics was this incredibly sorted, screwed up business. Um, shit got done. Yeah. Shit got done in a corrupt way with people stealing a bunch. 
Yep. But did shit get done at enormous velocity, really fast, all the time, in the physical world, not just building some goddamn software? Absolutely. Right. right? Look at the, you know, the way they built the Empire State Building. Right. right. This is the world that built the Empire State Building. So, and at this time, America, like China, is a third world country. It's culturally insecure. It does not have, before World War I, it's like, it's, it's a peninsula of Anglo-American culture. The center is in London and has always been in London. The center of finance is in London. You know, America is the periphery. American intellectuals look at this and they're like, we should be the future. Look at a map. And what we actually need is essentially, and you'll see this written very, very explicitly, for example, in Walter Lippmann, who I'm sure you've read. Yeah. Right? And, and what America needs is basically a new class of platonic guardians, a new class of basically people who are sort of so, you know, just are not these like sordid stealing politicians. Like, you know, the, so this comes out of people like Henry Adams, for example. Yes. Who's like this like fourth generation super, you know, he's like, you know, from this amazing political dynasty. He's like the intellectual leader of America, he's the editor of the North American Review, which was like the New Yorker of its day, but better. Um, and, and, you know, he's basically like that whole world of old money and old wealth is like, no, actually, this isn't working, and the new world will be a, a world of science, and it needs to be guided by science, and it needs to be guided by expertise. What comes out of that is the invention of sort of all these social sciences, which are really sciences of government, or it probably in most cases pseudosciences of government, because uh, they don't actually seem to work out very well uh, when you try them, which is a thing that normally- Sociology, psychology. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and so, you know, all of these things, so you get sort of, all of these sciences that are basically sciences of government and sciences of how the government should do something. And once sort of any kind of governing power, whether it's the people or a king or anything other than an oligarchy, decides that the oligarchy has the last vote and it's the oligarchy's opinion that counts and basically delegates it to the experts, the scientists, you know, the mandarins, the priests, whatever you call them, you've ceded power to these people. And then and, and, and the consequence democracy's done at that point. Oh yeah, the, the democracy. Yeah, remember my remember remember my two no's, right? You know, it isn't and it shouldn't be, and it right. can't be. And you, the American people just simply don't have the power to do that. Um, they don't have the energy. They have they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the energy. It's not a question of even whether they would do it well or badly. They would just do it weakly, and power would be instantly ripped from their hands. It would be like having an absolute monarch who's like six years old. There's no way this kid, even if he's the rightful king of France, is actually the king of France. Right. So, you know, his best choice is to use whatever power he has to make sure some guy who's not molesting him is the king of France. Uh, that's basically where we are, right? You know, and, and uh, sorry, that was, uh, that was a little coarser than my usual analogy. So good. But uh, uh, <laughs> the- um, Let her rip. Yeah, let her, let, let, let her, let her rip, right? Um, and so the- um, the problem is what this does to the experts. So it's like you basically have this pool of expertise. You have this network of expertise. And if you have a network of expertise in something that has no possible effect on power at all, like astronomers, you look at American astronomy and you say, has this been corrupted by power? You know, have astronomers, is there a woke astronomy? Not just woke staff practices in astronomy, but like seeing like constellations that aren't there, making up like new kinds of astronomical objects, just like totally out of nowhere, like for like, you know, uh, for headlines, uh, you know, no, no, I don't, think, I don't think we see that. Is there a woke math? No, I don't think we see that. When we look at the Soviet Union, again, centralized, you know, system, not, but still with many oligarchic, you know, had, had a party, right? Uh, you know, but it also had a leader. And, and you look at the Soviet Union, the math is fine. The math is perfectly fine. The astronomy is fine. Soviet astronomy, no, they're studying the same skies that we're studying. Soviet sociology, Soviet soci psychology, Marx-Lenin studies. It's just, it's all just trash. You know, um, and so when you look at American expertise, you tend to notice that things, the fields that are funny, that get weird and kind of screwed up are ones that involve telling the government what decisions to make. Right. And it seems that when you have a field, a way of people thinking that involves telling the government what decisions to make, suddenly 
you have this marketplace of ideas. And as a believer in oligarchy, you're like, okay, not only do we not have just one expert, we have a whole network of experts. And they're convincing each other. They're always arguing and they're, per, you know, they're participating in this adversarial discourse. Yeah, in math, that's what's going on. In astronomy, that's what's going on. In chemistry, that's what's going on. There's no politicized chemistry in the Soviet Union, right? But when it comes to sociology or like anything that involves advising the government, if you're advising the government to do more, by definition, you're making more of an impact. You matter more. And so what happens in an oligarchy is sort of this kind of currency of the trade becomes impact. It becomes mattering. And so, you know, let's say that you're studying Earth's climate. Back in like 1970, you were just studying Earth's climate. You were just like a weather nerd who was like, oh yeah, let's study the weather in a long term. Suddenly, you're sort of forced into the position where there is this global effect. Does it matter? Is it scary? What's going on here? And, you know, I'm what's called a, you know, a lukewarmist where, you know, I, yes, this effect is real, but I don't think it's all that important. Um, and, if you're, and there are plenty of very pedigreed climate scientists who are lukewarmists. And, and let's say Judith Curry, for example. And yeah. if you're someone like Judith Curry, you have, um, um, great, would be a great person to have on, by the way. Um, um, if you're someone like Judith Curry, she ran like the whole like, you know, huge, huge climatology lab for, for many, many years. Um, if you're someone like Judith Curry and you basically write a paper that says, this isn't very important, this is like happening, but you know, there's probably, you know, Afghanistan is something we should worry about more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, um, and you're attacking yourself. You're attacking all of your peers. You're saying your work is not very important. You should not be getting a lot of money. You do not matter very much at all. And you're basically, you're not being a team player. And so in the landscape of the marketplace of ideas, Things that say this whole marketplace is unimportant and shouldn't grow its budget next year um, are vastly disfavored because basically they're really, really antisocial. And all, you know, and, and so that sort of craving when you're inside the deep state and you're sort of, and you have that craving for impact, it has a much more definite form. You're basically looking for funds. You know, there's this whole world of things that write grants that apply for funds. And so this whole world basically has this enormous incentive to over you know, emphasize its importance and to matter and to make an impact. Well, guess who wanted to make an impact? Some virologists. And these virologists were like, you know, going along, doing virology, just being virology nerds. And then SARS happened. SARS happened, and this virus jumped out of a bat uh, into a civet cat, into human beings, and killed a lot of people, unfortunately, wasn't well enough adapted to humans to start a pandemic. So naturally, if something bad happens, and you're writing a grant, a good way to write that grant is to say, well, this something bad could happen again. Let's study this thing um, to understand it, to make sure we're better equipped to something if it happens again. We can predict it. We can learn more about this phenomenon. This is important science because this is something real that has affected the real world. Good grant proposal. So basically you write that grant proposal and you're like, I know what, let's go into like bat caves in China and find all the bat viruses and see if these bat viruses could emerge into humans. And how will we see if they could emerge into humans? Well, we'll screw around with them and try to make them into human viruses. What could go wrong, right? And you know, the, the, the ostensible goal, and this was not a Chinese research project. This was an right. American research project started by a Chinese grad student here who went back to Wuhan and was doing that there. The infamous Batwoman, uh, yeah. Xi Jingli, right? And, and, but this was, an Amer this was American science. Uh, I think Americans probably ma maintain their virology labs a little more carefully. If you've ever been to China, yeah, um, and and um, you know, there's this word in Chinese. Um, my daughter speaks Chinese, so she's going to yell at me for screwing this up on there. Chao bu duo, which means um, good enough. <laughs> um, and so you're basically saying, okay, we're going to have this, you know, and that was one of the two things that happened in 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 China. The other thing is, I don't know if you're familiar with the phenomenon of the Chinese paper mill. So in science, of course, which has been subjected to these kind of bureaucratic um, um, goals, your goal is to publish as many papers as possible. 
And so you do everything as you can do to publish high impact papers, as many as you can. That's how you succeed in science today. In China, it's even much more rigorous than that. It's like, you've got to get five high impact papers in this journal to be the head of your lab. It's like totally quantitative. And so you get um, a lot of production of basically low quality papers from China right. in a lot of different fields, including my field of computer science. Um, and so what you had was basically people going out, virologists going out, finding all the bat viruses they could, screwing around with them in labs in countries that all, everyone involved in this research had an incentive to exaggerate the danger of the research because they had to exaggerate the importance of the research. Of course. The more dangerous your virus is, the more important it is. So basically what you've done with virology by saying the virologists um, should run the show because decisions about what virology to study should be taken by virologists, naturally you're gonna get gain of function research because these virologists are basically in this like Darwinian cycle of exaggerating their own importance and the more dangerous these viruses are, the more important they are. So and it's inevitable they will wind up creating viruses. Yeah, they they will dangerous. actually wind up creating the virus that they are then literally hired to solve. Okay, so this you, is the case of Dr. Fauci, right? You know, and, and, and so you, know, you basically created this system of incentives you know, to sort of step back a second and talk about how these oligarchies work. You know, but this is not a sustainable system that you're describing. This is describing. not a sustainable system, but it degrades slowly. And so what happens is this system was initially populated by these really wise and capable people, the Americans of the first half of the century. Can we say they were diverse? No, we cannot say that. But it was, you know, they were amazing people. They got shit done. They conquered the world. They were a big deal. They were the best and the brightest. They built the bomb, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Biggest engineering, you know, hey, libertarians, libertarians out there, biggest and best engineering project of the world, Manhattan Project. Yeah. Government project run like a startup. Um, and, and the government project run like a startup. How can you, you can't do that anywhere today, right? And so, you know, you're looking at the system of like, we're gonna delegate these decisions to these oligarchs these experts, these institutions, these prestigious things with the nice fonts and the black letter names that are super competitive and hard to get into. And what's happening is that you're sort of, you're feeding, there's this great Latin phrase, who will watch the watchdogs? I'd try Latin, but I don't really, I'd, I'd screw it up. Um, and, and then people would yell at me. And who should watch the watchmen, right? And our answer is, oh, we're gonna have this decentralized collective network of watchmen that we're gonna funnel all of this toxic, we know that power corrupts. And so we're gonna basically act like an early, well, the early Americans sucked at some things, and one of those things was environmentalism. And so they're we're gonna basically say, you know what we're gonna do with all our power pollution? We're basically gonna just pipe it into this really big lake. And for a while that worked. For a while, basically you have this field of experts and you say, oh, we're gonna take these like intellectuals at these universities the ideas of, of like universities telling what the government, the government what to do, like in 1900, is ridiculous. It's like a weird, they do that in Germany, right? Um, and, and now it's like assumed, like, my God, uh, no, how would you, like, the government would decide on its own? On it, maybe the intelligence community does that sometimes? Uh, they don't seem to do a very good job of that. Um, you know, no, of course you ask Harvard. And what you're doing is you're basically, when you say, of course you ask Harvard, you're pumping power into these institutions. And what you don't realize is you're polluting them with power. And after a while, instead of getting this answer which people have disagreed on and fought over intellectually and been all philosophical about like the way you're imagining these things you know, working, no, you're actually just being told what you wanted to hear. And so you have this whole system of who actually makes decisions, who actually makes calls. So before our, our hour ends here, um, let's get back to Afghanistan. So what a lot of the people out there in America don't really understand is they think they still have a World War II army out there. Just as they still think they have a World War II bureaucracy, World War II agencies. I mean, if you look right. at trust in these agencies, like public trust in these agencies, do I trust the government to do the right thing? You know, like 85% of Americans in like 1950 will say yes, of course. And the ones who don't are like communists, you know, and, yeah. and, 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 and this was the level of trust under which the world was conquered and, you know, like 
all of these interstates were built. This is a lost and forgotten era. And you know, today, of course, people look at the like they look at the Congress. Like you know, uh, one thing that I, I like to observe that breaks people's brains, but no one can disagree with. If you look at the executive branch, it's really the legislative branch. It's managed by Congress, not by the White House. This is why when you elect a president, the wires of power basically go nowhere. He can't reorganize these agencies. He can't tell them what to do. You know, there are no, no, Congress never goes and testifies, you know, agencies never go and testify at the White House. Um, Congress micromanages them completely through what are called laws. Um, and so you're looking at this, this crazy thing in reality, and there is no accountability. There are sort of no incentives. It's like if you ran like a, you know, a car factory for like 50 years and you ran it in Soviet style and it had weird production quotas and things and it didn't matter what people thought of the cars. So, you know, what most people don't know is that this has affected DOD as well. This is not just a civilian thing. This has affected both sides of Washington, red Washington as well as blue Washington. Well, I think we've and, all discovered that. So I yeah. just gotta ask you, you're describing uh, a system that destroys itself. Yes. It degrades um, over time. That's right. Yeah. And, but that degradation seems to be accelerating. I, I, that's a hard thing to say. It's, 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 a, it's a really hard thing to assess. Well, how long assess. does this last and what is it replaced by? Oh, um, I think it can go, uh, you know, completely indefinitely. I mean, it, it basically just gets worse and worse. Uh, you know, it, people always ask me, you know, there's a sort of trope in conservatism to always think you're at a turning point. Right. I think there's an there's an organization called that or something. Um, and, you know, there's this constant, if you read old, go back and read, like, you know, the National Review from, like, 1982 or something. You know, it's always a turning point. Uh, it's always, do we go this way or that way and send money now, right? And, and <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, you know, you should send money at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to be doing that. Uh, um, and, and, um, um, Televangelism. I mean, it works. <laughs> and and um, 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 all right, send, send it to me. Subscribe to subscribe to my newsletter, which you can find at Gray Mirror with an A at Substack.com. Um, and so, you know, there's this when, when you ask what comes now, there's this sort of the reason I take issue, the reason I'm busting your balls over this, Tucker, is that when you ask what comes now, there's a sense of helpless automatism there. And you're like, okay, well, you know. History has these big cycles and moves in these big waves, and you know what's coming along sort of next for us. And it, this is what's called the Whig theory of history, yes. um, you know, which is the, well the Whig theory of history. That's Whig with an H, uh, is that there's a sort of relentless progress of history, and then it always thinks keep always getting 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 better and better. And I'm like, you know, that's funny when I look look at pictures of this place from like 50 years ago and now. It actually like doesn't seem to be getting better. Like it seems to actually be getting worse. Much worse. And and you know there are all these people in Silicon Valley who are like studying like you know progress. I'm like, well, progress is great. Let's let's worry about like not regressing first, shall we? Yeah. Um, and yeah. and and you just see all of you know the evidence of decline that you see when you look for it. Just the physical evidence, like yes. driving through I'm America. I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. Driving through America. You know, it's like um um. How much time do we have left? Do we have? How much time are we in? I think we're about an hour in. Uh, you know, I was, I was, uh, you know, okay, decline everywhere, et cetera. You're the only person I've ever interviewed on this show where I said, no, we only have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the op automatism of, oh, you know, this system is just, you know, is bound to collapse or something. No, there's no way in which it's bound to collapse. I know the, and it's very easy to look at what the future is. It's called the third world. You can go there, you can see pictures of it. Everything is just gonna continue to get more and more third world indefinitely until in like 100 years or so, you're basically at Venezuela, or maybe 50 years, I don't know. But that's, that's the, you know, that's sort of the default future that you're on. Let me give you the other future that, because I know we're out of time, that I think we're on, which is one of the things, uh, it's interesting, I was uh, recently called out with uh, by uh, the, um, can I say this word on the air, the one that starts with a C? I was recently called out by the people at the Bulwark or something for being friends with Mike Anton, uh, the, the Flight 93 guy. And uh, I like Mike Anton. Yeah, I love Mike Anton. He's he's awesome. Uh, didn't did you, did you have him on here? Recently? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Mike Anton is amazing, right? And and you we know we want to keep the discourse alive. And and, on this and, show. and 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 they're like, my God, you're friends with this Curtis Yarvin person, right? And uh, Curtis Yarvin has this strange, you know, theory. And then they went through uh, 
sort of uh, caricatures, not actually terribly inaccurate character caricatures of uh, my perspective. And one of the things that they mentioned, which I happen to believe is true, if you look at American history the way people read French history, uh, which is they number the republics. So I think they're yeah. officially on their fifth republic. Uh, I might call it the sixth. Um, you know, uh, at, at present. Um, this is also the way America works. So actually we're on about our fourth republic here in America because the fund, first of all, you have a complete change of constitutional document in 1789 with the constitution, which is really basically a right-wing monarchical coup that results in what is essentially the Hamilton administration. Yeah. And so what you have at the start of, you know, American history, the USG, this thing in Washington, is Alexander Hamilton basically being the CEO of the United States government. And even though he's nominally just the Secretary of the Treasury, he's basically running everything and Washington is running political interference for him. So you have this system which is actually, it works a lot like a monarchy, which is like a company, like a startup. It's like, you know, do you drive a car? Your car was made by a monarchy. Uh, do you go to a restaurant? Your restaurant is a monarchy. Um, every functional, you know, institution in the world has this, you know, very simple pyramid structure. So at the beginning of this era, kind of the second American Republic, the first being the, the Congress of the Convention, which is just a complete shit show and has actually been really airbrushed out of history. Like you don't even know the, the names of the politicians involved in that shit show. Um, you know, there's just always this like, who was the first president question that, yeah. you know, is the, like the president of the Congress. Um, and I think people even disagree on that. You know, like it's this complete mess. And out of this mess, basically, Hamilton is like, I'm gonna create a government. I'm gonna create what is essentially a sovereign company that is in charge of all of these states that acts like a government that has, that does government like financial things and foreign relation things. And he wanted to do a lot of trade restriction, which unfortunately he didn't get to, but later that, that became adopted in the so-called American system. And um, you know, he created this monarchy. Right, but of course, you know, he goes out in this stupid duel. Yeah. Um, and the system degrades, it basically falls apart and it becomes more and more oligarchic. There's a lot of ways of doing oligarchy. You can have oligarchies of wealth, you can have oligarchies of violence, uh, you know, the, the sort of you know, institutional test-based oligarchy that we have now, which is so freaking strange, is sort of only one of many ways to do this. Um, and um, you sort of get this kind of, uh, ossif kind of benign ossification of the US government right up to the Civil War. And in, in, you know, in the Civil War you have this very small kind of out of touch government. And again, it becomes completely revolutionized by America's Third Republic in which basically the Constitution has a different meaning or rather resolves an ambiguity in the original meaning. And once again, you find one individual completely in charge of the government. Yes. Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln is mainly kind of an intuitive po you know, politician. And look who's actually in charge of the government, uh, John Hay, um, and God, what's his first name? Hay and Nicolay. Um, and they're startup kids. They're kids just like all the founders you'll find running around San Francisco. Here's this couple of incredibly smart, you know, kids with patrician backgrounds who are in their 20s, and they're just like, we're gonna create a government. We're going to do it. We're going to found this thing. It's like starting Uber. And, and, and that was basically the third American Republic was a kind of new generation of sort of monarchically organized civil service that starts with these people. Then again, you have another revolution in the form of FDR. So FDR comes in and this thing has become tremendously ossified and full right. of these old corrupt politicians and hidebound and bureaucratic and small and just has not adapted to this itself, to this new way of government by intellectual. And FDR is, is fine, that's fine, we're just gonna come in. FDR could, you know, he had some trouble with some of the older line agencies, he liked to create new agencies, he could create agencies, he could destroy agencies, you know, no one can do that shit in Washington now. No one has that kind of power. And so, you know, are there limits, he has a, basically a rubber stamp Congress, 
Um, he makes this incredible, uh, you know, I do this, uh, there's no time for this here, but I do this great rendition of FDR's first inaugural. I've heard it. You've heard it. Uh, in which basically, if I change a couple of names, people think it's Hitler. Because yeah. basically what he's doing is he's bullying Congress. And he's like, Congress, you must give me absolute power or I will just take it. And you don't want that to happen. That was basically FDR's message to Congress, right? So the thing is, again, you see this sort of legitimate American monarchy where you see the presidency, which was originally designed as a monarchy, sort of as, you know, just not in the sense of a hereditary monarchy, but just in the sense of one manager, like, again, all other functional institutions in the universe. And, you know, and you see it sort of reassert that form and recreate and, and redefine what government is and just kind of wrote around this whole old mess. So it's like when you look at Afghanistan and you're like, how would I fix DOD so it wouldn't do this shit? It's impossible. Just like lay the whole thing off, keep, keep the equipment, keep you know, some of the engineers basically at the contractors developing the equipment, keep special ops, like the rest of it, like who is invading us anyway? Right? And, oh, we have some theoretical quarrel over Taiwan? Like what? And you just you start to look at these whole systems, which all date to FDR's world, which are all sort of built on the assumptions that were made in FDR's world. And those assumptions sort of keep getting rationalized over and over again. And those rationalizations are incredibly deeply embedded at this kind of fundamental level in government. So for example, you've probably heard the term national security. When does that term date to? That term is an FDR era term, and it was sort of originally invented with most of the language of DOD, which used to be, of course, the War Department, um, basically to tell Americans that securing their own country, the nation, required providing global leadership to the entire, entire world. Uh, if you ever have a real State Department believer on um, and you want them to like, you know, spin around very quickly in their seat, ask them what the difference is between global leadership and world domination. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so, you know, you have this whole bureaucracy of world domination, which won't even, you know, there's no world domination council. There's no, you know, like, which is under, you know, operating wholly under the theory that the only way to secure America is to secure the world, which is not a ridiculous theory. It's a theory worth considering. It is definitely not a theory worth assuming. I agree and, 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 and so, you know, the capacity to sort of question a, a, a theory like this at a very deep level does not exist in the regime. And, um, and, 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 so, and so you don't have institutions. And so, you know, just to finish my spiel, when we had this amazing terrorism thing, which has given just such this amazing post-Cold War, like, burst of life to DOD, which now seems to be ending, so I guess you know maybe probably we'll get some more terrorism at some point, and uh, they'll get they'll get back on that. But it gave this you know it created people's careers at DoD. They were fighting in the global war on terror. You know I saw this uh, funny tweet. Uh, Congratulations to uh, Terror for winning the war on terror. Uh, you know I guess and to drugs uh, for winning the war on and drugs. And drugs have also won the war on drugs. Poverty has obviously just kicked our asses all around. <laughs> in the war on poverty, right? You know, maybe it's time to realize that you're not as good at war as you think, you know? And, and, and this is a systemic problem across the regime. You just can't imagine, like, fixing DOD to be able to do something as so simple me, and basic as occupying. So give me the two-minute answer. How long are we in? We're pretty far in. We're pretty far in. All right. So Are, we going I gotta, so Are you got to cut me? You got to cut me off. You got to cut me off. Well, but I want to know what the next regime is. So you're describing... Uh, uh, it's very simple. I'll, I'll give you, you know. Like, me, there's no leadership is basically what you keep saying. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, you know, um, the next regime, and I think, you know, one of the differences I have with Mike Anton is that, you know, uh, we talk about Caesarism a lot. And, you know, you're clearly, from my perspective, looking very much at a fall of the Roman Republic event here yeah. in a best case scenario. Uh, worst case scenario is more like the fall of the Roman Empire. Right. Um, let's go for the best case scenario. But we're clearly and, at a and, transition between one form of government and another. Yes. And the thing that to observe, of, and the reason why the fall of the Roman Republic is a best case scenario, is that it got a couple of very good CEOs in a row. It got Caesar, who was an excellent CEO, but could have worked a little harder on his personal security. And then it got Augustus, who was merely a very good CEO, who continued a Caesar's regime for like 30 years or whatever. And, and by the time you know, Augustus had reinvented the Roman state, 
it was a pretty effective organization, and that's why it ruled the known world for the next 400 years, despite, you know, fucking some shit up. Yeah. And, and so, and, and one of the, the sort of critical points of that transition, and I think that's sort of one of the most important things is sort of, am I really seeing this? Or am I not really seeing this? One of the important things about am I seeing this is that Caesar, although, you know, Rome has this like red versus blue thing that's been going on for like 400 years. You know, the, the conflict of the orders, the patricians against the plebeians, right. uh, you know, and then it turns into the, the populares versus the optimates. And Caesar is a red state guy. He's a, pop, he's a populist. He comes out of the party of the populares. Um, he's, a, he's set against the old Senate. And the old Senate basically is very oligarchical. And one of the reasons why they always lose their wars against Caesar is they basically can't actually delegate their power to a single leader. Caesar, so Caesar comes, he's a red state guy, but he comes out, of, he, and that's where he comes out of, but his mission in ruling Rome is to rule all of Rome and to unify Rome. And so, you know, the way he does that doesn't involve giving any power back to the Senate. But, for example, one of the things Caesar doesn't do, which is a normal thing to do in a Roman regime change, is basically kill his enemies and take their money. Because he's basically like, no, actually, you're not my enemies anymore because the struggle is over. So, you know, the most important thing that you need to look for in kind of the next sort of regime change in this country, assuming it follows the pattern of the past, which is basically under the same constitution, the regime reinvents itself every, two, every 75 or right. 80 years. It's kind of like an earthquake, like the San Andreas Fault is about due to go. Um, so the quality, and I can guess what you're going to say, is does the next leader bring the professional class with him? Yes. And, and the thing is, basically, does he have a message to those people? Is his message to those people, if his message is, you know, to those people is, I'm just going to kill you where you stand, like Rwanda, and like throw your body in the stream, um, that's not going to work out very well. Right. And, right. and so, and, but the, th the thing is that the message of, like, this is a really, you know, we're both from this class, we can say this. Uh, these are, in many ways, the best people in America. And just as human beings, their ideas are terrible. But as human beings, they're wonderful. They have the best taste. They eat the best food. These are not insignificant things. This is an aristocracy. And so, you know, the thing is that basically populism has to kind of get beyond this aristophobia and basically say, just as these, you know, these are wonderful people. They've been corrupted by power. They're like a beautiful lake into which like 80 years of dioxin has been flowing. And, you know, they just they don't think about anything besides making an impact and getting more status and getting, you know, their name in lights at the New Yorker or, or whatever. And they know that these institutions have rotted and are actually horrible in a way. It's like, you know, wherever they've been corrupted by power. You know what the best thing in the New Yorker is? You know what the best thing in the New Yorker Shout is? Got some murmurs? No, the, car the cartoons. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> they're the right. only subversive thing. They're the only thing. subversive thing. And why is that? Because basically there isn't like a new breed of like, they, they're, they're just above being woke. They just don't matter enough to get woke. Right. Right. And, and so they're like math. They've sort of been incorrupted. And so the thing is that basically if you want to, you know, first of all, there's just no world in which you can do this without electing a president who says, I am the chief executive of the executive branch. I am gonna reinvent the executive branch. And the way I'm gonna do it is simply by working around the one we have and creating a new one which has all the power. As for the people we have, with very few exceptions, they'll be retired. And we are just gonna create a new government yeah. next to the old one and we are gonna shut the old one down in a very nice and peaceful way that does not involve dragging any bodies through the street, that involves probably your retirement benefits are gonna be increased. You're gonna get an awesome severance if you work for this old thing because we're actually buying you out. We're saying you have power. Okay, so here's what the American people are gonna do to you. We're gonna print a whole bunch of money because that's really one of the things that we're still good at. We're gonna print a whole bunch of money and we're gonna buy you out. And you're just done. And it's like the day after, you know, you know what, there's a funny fact about regime change. The Federal Republic of Germany is still paying pensions, not only to retired Stasi officers, but also to retired Wehrmacht officers. It is accepted that both of those regimes were Germany. If you serve those regimes, 
and you weren't like some kind of major criminal who's been prosecuted, yeah, you're entitled to your pension. And the way that shutdown worked is that the day the doors of the Stasi building were closed and these people were sent home, you couldn't reboot that system. So what you don't do is disband the Iraqi army and declare them all. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, no, you can disband the Iraqi army. You can't, like, declare them persona non grata <laughs> right, and exactly. send them fleeing. And you have to put in your own government as well. Curtis Yarman. Now, I think we've gone, like, maybe an hour and 20. And I think anyone who's... How long? We've gone a long time. Oh, shit. And anybody who has watched to this point, I think, was expanded. Even people who didn't agree with the word you said. And it just tells you, again, what a sad moment this is because you're not talking on TV every day and people like you don't have an opportunity to talk more. You can read, what's the name of your? Gray Mirror, gray with an A, the American way. Gray Mirror dot substack, S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K dot com. If you just Google Gray Mirror, I think I'm above like the product ads now. Um, so just type, type Gray Mirror into your Google bar and then um, send me money. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you tr- if you think that a country this great deserves a you know, robust, scintillating conversation about what's happening, if you think that like actual philosophy has a place in our life, and I do. Then you got to let it be a grift and you got to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tucker. <laughs> the name of the show is Tucker Carlson. Today, it exists for conversations like this every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on Fox Nation. We'll see you every weeknight on the Fox News Channel. <laughs>